I just want to say the picture that Michael presents is a little bit like the story of Senator Cray Deeds and Gus. It totally changes the way you think about the problem. And the data and the understanding coming from China make us pause before we want to impose our solutions on that problem. It really is very different and it makes you think about what is mental illness and how do we define it? How do you define it there? And why is Tom Insel so different in his thinking that 90% of all suicide is related to me mental illness? And Michael is showing us that it may be a very small percent, but it really makes us stop and think uh, before we jump to conclusions. And thank you for that, Michael. We'll come back to the discussion. I want to turn it over now to Mike Luo, you see in front of you, Mike, we're showing the front pages of a couple of your stories. Um, one is the story of mixing guns and mental illness, and the other is when the right to bear arms includes the mentally ill. And I asked Mike to think about some of the most important points he wanted to make from these stories, and what were some of the most critical questions he thought we needed to think about and look at if we wanted to make progress in this area. But Mike, thanks for staying with us. Thanks for joining us. Let me turn it over to you. Yeah, um, thanks, Mark. Um, so um, I'll talk most about the most recent story first, uh, the one uh, when right to bear arms includes the mentally ill. Um, just for some context, this was part of a year-long series of uh, stories that we did on guns after the Newtown shootings. They were um, investigative stories that, spe that took, uh, you know, uh, several months to do in most cases, um, breaking new ground on issues like gun accidents involving children and uh, uh, Internet and guns and uh, protection orders and firearms. And um, I often talk to people like Daniel um, uh, in the academic community um, uh, he's, a, he's been a favorite source of mine for sort of guidance and shaping uh, where we should be looking for these targets. Um, and so the, this, this particular story, uh, uh, the origins came from just a general observation that probably a lot of you have made, that um, um, uh, when you look at some of the mass shootings, uh, I started on doing these investigative stories on guns after uh, the Tucson shooting where uh, Gabby Giffords, a congresswoman, was shot. Um, and she was uh, shot by this uh, young man, Jared Loeffner. Um, and then you look at James Holmes in Aurora, Colorado, in the movie theater shooting there, and you, or the most, most recent one, the Washington Navy Yard, uh, the shooter there. Th these are all people who are clearly uh, mentally ill, um, uh, clearly people we wouldn't want to have firearms, um, clearly seriously uh, disturbed, but yet uh, were actually never barred from having guns uh, um, uh, based on federal and state laws in where they lived. Um, and, that's, and that's because um, uh, the current federal standard is that, that, that bars you from having, being able to purchase or possess firearms is... Uh, uh, that you have to have been involuntarily committed uh, um, to a mental health institution or adjudicated uh, as quote unquote mental defective, uh, which essentially means a legal authority judged you to be mentally incompetent or insane. Um, and so the vast majority of people obviously who um, are uh, dealing with uh, mental illness um, uh, never even serious uh, mental illness never get to this point um, where they're actually involuntarily committed. And so there are large numbers of people out there um, uh, with, with serious mental health issues um, who are perfectly able and willing to uh, um, uh, uh, buy guns and have guns. Um, and so I wanted this, we, Mike McIntyre, my colleague on this, we wanted to get sort of a, a better picture of who these people are, and um, the, the the thing that we are interested in uh, in newspapers that's different from academia is, is uh, you know, we want concrete examples and sort of put faces to names and actually sort of build out people's stories. Um, and so, um, the challenge obviously is is, is there's a big uh, public records challenge in this area because basically you want to know 
uh, who is mentally ill, who has firearms. And so now you're dealing with two of the biggest, uh, uh, most closely protected areas uh, in terms of privacy is, uh, you know, uh, mental health and um, uh, gun ownership. Um, uh, some of you might not know, but, like, it's incredibly – uh, in very, very few states when, uh, are, are the records of who, uh, uh, of, uh, who has been issued a concealed handgun permit um, is made available. The, the gun lobby has uh, made a concerted effort to, to, to make that uh, uh, off limits to public records requests. Um, and a few and fewer states have this. And as a result, for reporters like me who are trying to connect up uh, those kinds of records with uh, and match them up with other databases, it's uh, harder and harder to do this kind of research. So the the way we actually went about doing this then was um, 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 we went we started talking to police departments and courts across the country um, to ask them uh, for records of uh, people that they've actually confiscated firearms from for mental health reasons. So these are, in most cases, that we were getting um, um, uh, police records, like going to a police department, and um, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll uh, um, the, each state has different sort of uh, procedures for this, and, and there's uh, uh, um, uh, where they go to a mental health call, and they, and they, and they um, uh, in, in a lot of cases, take them for an, uh, a, a sort of a temporary emergency hospitalization uh, it's not enough to disqualify them from having firearms, but they're, they deem them to be sort of dangerous to themselves or others, and therefore they uh, uh, um, uh, maybe confiscate the firearm that they have on their person and uh, take them to the hospital for examination. And at that point, they are evaluated, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is sort of a determination down the road if they, if they wind up being uh, uh, involuntarily committed, which, is, which will involve a longer hospitalization um, and a court procedure, uh, and so uh, it, it so this this uh, we thought that this would be actually a window into this sort of world, and um, but then there actually our best success in terms of getting this picture uh, ca came in in two states where actually have a sort of a stricter law that um, where they give much greater leeway to uh, police to take uh, um, uh, firearms from people. Um, um, because there's actually a, a big sort of legal um, uh, dilemma that the police are confronting when they when they deal with these situations. A lot of departments are actually d discussing and debating whether they are even allowed to. So you you run, so you you're, you're a police officer. You encounter somebody on the street who's suicidal. He has a gun on him. Okay, so most police departments would agree you can take that firearm from that person. Um, but well, what if uh, you know the guy doesn't have a gun on his person, but he has one at home? Uh, can you t go and take that gun or 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 one in his car and and um, a lot of departments would actually say no we ha we don't have that right to go and take that gun from that person unless we get a warrant um, and so anyway so in Con but in two states Connecticut and Indiana actually had passed laws that gave uh, police greater leeway to do this and so that actually you know allowed us to get us in Connecticut for example we were able to sort of uh, in the past year in Connecticut, there were 180 instances of, of where police departments confiscated guns from people who uh, posed a, they deemed to be posed a risk of uh, imminent uh, personal injury or to self or others. Um, and so not all those cases are mental illness related. We, we went through the records, the court records, um, and found that about 40% of those cases involved serious mental illness. So there's sort of one sort of example from uh, that state. In, in Indiana, the, the records uh, were not centralized, and, um, and so we looked at one county, the uh, Indianapolis, uh, or which had the Marion County, which includes Indianapolis. And so we found in, in 2012 there were, there were uh, police seized guns from 30 people. There were 67 guns that they took. And about, again, about almost 40 percent of those cases involved some sort of mental illness. Um, uh, and so, anyway, so that that gives that gives you sort of a little sort of window into some some numbers. So, the, but the the other interesting thing that we came across as we started to uh, uh, look into this was um, uh, how hard it was actually for police. So, so police were confiscating these firearms, and then we were discovering that actually 
often in times very shortly afterward they had to return the firearms. So what was what was happening is somebody was uh, um, they they encountered somebody you know maybe they're suicidal maybe they were um, you know uh, hearing voices or something somebody called the police and so they confiscated their firearm they went to for observation and um, they were not committed and so um, I mean this is a whole different sort of this discussion but uh, in in the United States now in most states it's very very difficult to involuntarily commit somebody. Um, I actually subsequently got some data from from Hillsborough County in Florida, where I actually had we done did some of this research, and the numbers that were were pretty shocking to me of like how 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 difficult it is to involuntarily commit somebody. So, anyways, so a lot of these people that they that that uh, firearms were taken from, um, uh, they don't end up being committed. So then they get released from the hospital, uh, um, you know, with the assumption that they're going to be taking their medication or getting treatment or something like that. And um, they go back to the police department, and they said, "I'd like my firearm back." And in some cases, this is like a couple weeks later, or you know, a couple months later. Um, and and these departments were, uh, uh, when you talk to their lawyers, you know, a lot of cases they're very uncomfortable about this. Um, but in uh, a lot of departments, basically came to the conclusion that we have to return them. There's there's nothing legally barring these people from still having a firearm. Um, and so we're going to have to return them. And this is actually, you know, um, in the Indiana law actually stemmed from, a, from like the kind of exact, this exact scenario. There was a, a man with schizophrenia who um, um, uh, uh, police confiscated his firearms, the, the, the uh, Indianapolis Police Department, and um, uh, uh, he eventually asked for them back. They, they sort of dragged their feet a little bit because and, and, they didn't want to return them, and eventually they, 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 the lawyer uh, for the department concluded that, that there's not really nothing that um, legally barring them from, from, from not having firearms, and so they reluctantly returned them. And um, uh, shortly after that, um, uh, he was involved in a, um, um, uh, 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 a shooting with police, and he uh, killed a, uh, an Indianapolis police officer. And, and that's what uh, prompted their, their, um, uh, them to pass this, this law that gave police greater uh, authority to seize, search for and seize firearms from people with mental illness and um, hold on to them if they are deemed to be dangerous uh, still. And so, uh, one, I mean, just one, another sort of number uh, to sort of illustrate how, how easy it is. Uh, like in Hillsborough County, Florida, where we looked, uh, they, they police made people go through a court process to uh, to just check their record to make sure that there's nothing legally barring them from having firearms. And um, the number I'm gonna get that off the not off the top of my head here. Um, I think it was something along the lines of 21 out of 24 cases last year. They the 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 the, the they were able to, they, somebody who requested for their firearm to return was returned. And even though, and, and this gets into sort of our examples, um, and, um, you know, the, the, there are some really serious cases here. I mean, like, you know, in Hillsborough County, which I was just referencing, there was, I, I looked at this case of this, uh, this guy, Ryan Pied, who was an Afghanistan veteran with a you know, long history of treatment for depression, anxiety, and paranoia. Police descended on his workplace because he, uh, he, uh, he had made some intimations of violence to a psychiatrist, and he tried to renounce his citizenship, actually, and um, uh, and so then they confiscated, they, they took him to, uh, uh, he was involuntarily hospitalized, he didn't end up being committed, and uh, um, they confiscated two guns from his car and one from his toolbox, and a couple months later he asked for them back, and because he'd never been committed, uh, uh, he was, they were returned. Um, you know, we had another guy in Colorado, which is very similar, uh, where, you know, he had multiple uh, attempted suicides uh, in the last couple of years. The police encountered him on another suicide situation um, and uh, took his guns. He didn't end up getting committed. And, uh, you know, a couple you know, a couple months later, I think he, would, he went back and, and, and they gave him back. And, he, and, and in some of these cases I talked to, I actually called these, these folks and asked them, like, uh, you know, what was the process like for you to get your firearm returned? And they were actually shocked how easy it was. Um, um, they, they expected to have to go through a big pro, uh, gauntlet of process and, and ended up not really having to do that much at all. Mike, um, 
this is this is Mark. Yeah. Can I ask you a question here? Yeah. It seems to me that you were kind of amazed and aghast at how hard it was to remove a weapon from someone who seemed to be a threat to themselves or someone else. And you were amazed at how easy it was for them to get their weapon back. If you had to point out what you think are some critical areas where we need more study and better policies, is this one of those areas? And what are those areas you think where we need more studies and better policies? Right. Well, this is so that I'm not pretending that this is easy. Um, so, uh, so obviously their, their standard right now is involuntary commitment. Um, and, uh, and there are clearly plenty of people who are dangerous who are never involuntarily committed we probably don't want having firearms, and everyone would agree don't, uh, shouldn't have firearms. But then the question is then what is your standard? So a lot of these people that we were encountering were involuntarily hospitalized for like these emergency detentions um, because police or somebody else determined they were dangerous themselves or others, but they didn't end up getting to the point where they are committed. So then do you want to make the standard at that level of emergency detention um, or, or do you want to set it so that, okay, that person is not allowed to possess or purchase a firearm for six months, one year, you know, two years? Uh, um, and and the, the other story that, that, I, that I did uh, um, that I'll just reference really quick actually touches upon how difficult this is. The other story I did back in 2011 was about looking at this process of restoration of firearms rights of people with a history of mental illness. So these were people who actually... Um, lost their gun rights because they were committed. Um, and so I discovered after the Virginia Tech shootings that uh, uh, through this sort of, the NRA had sort of extracted this concession um, in this law that was designed to sort of incre improve uh, reporting of mental health records to the FBI's um, uh, database of prohibited people who, who purchased their firearms. Um, uh, the, the, the NRA had extracted this concession that states were only going to get money for this uh, uh, record improvement if they enacted a process that allowed people with a history of mental illness who are barred to restore their gun rights by through some sort of process. And so I was l looking at cases where people went to court, they had been committed, and then they asked the judge to get their rights restored. And various states had set up different policies. And, and the bottom line in that story was there it was it was, they were all, it was very haphazard. You know, there are plenty of people who you know the judges were missing information. There were people who, you know, clearly probably, I mean, I, I went out and met some people who, who had their gun rights restored, and they were completely, you know, uh, crazy, uh, uh, hearing voices and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, but then the question then becomes, and, and in the course of working on that story, obviously, I, I, I learned a lot about violence risk assessment and how, how do you sort of, you know, these actuarial models for predicting violence and, and how do you sort of, what is the best way to sort of predict that somebody who is mentally ill, like, has a risk for future violence because we know the vast majority of people with mental illness are not violent, but they do pose a uh, elevated risk of violence compared to the general population, particularly when substance abuse is involved. So how do you sort of draw the line? Uh, the, the problem in, in, in the U.S., obviously, is that we're, you know, we're running into the Second Amendment and, and, and the collision of the Second Amendment and public health. So where do you draw the line? Are you, and where are you sort of you know, taking this, uh, this right to bear arms away and then where are you sort of, you know, appropriately uh, protecting uh, public safety?